Christianity is, re is a religion of Bible authority. Remove the authority of the Word of God, and you destroy Christianity. The proof of one's love of God is in the keeping of commandments. Jesus said that, John 14, verse 15. Thus, the proof of our love is to do only as he is authorized and all we think, say, and do. Most people simply don't think that way, and even certain members of the church don't think that way. But if you're going to let Christ live in you, then you have to know his word because the mind of Christ is in the word of Christ. Now today I would like to speak with us so that we can understand even better about our worship. I want to start off by talking about a long time ago friend of mine who was a member of the church. We were both the same age, graduated in the same, Bible, uh, same uh, high school class. And we both at that time uh, said we wanted to be preachers. And after about two years, in fact, we started preaching at the same place. And, and for a while we preached there. He, we would alternate Sundays. He had a couple of cousins. They were not members of the church. <clears throat> they were members of a denomination. And they began to try to impress upon him that the use of mechanical instruments of music in the worship were, wasn't necessary, wasn't important. And sometime, I think roughly about 1966, somewhere along there, he tried to convince me that mechanical instrumental music was not sin, that it was all right, that it was nothing to divide over among those who believed in Christ and claimed to be Christians. And we had quite a discussion about it. And after a while, he didn't stay with the church over a period of years after he left college or graduated. And today, uh, while he's still alive, as far as I know, I don't think he's been a part of the church for years because he was of a subjective nature and he approached all of it that way to the point of finally he just didn't believe much what the New Testament said about the one church. But we had quite a discussion and that was 50 some odd years ago. Those things were coming then in the church, a lot of my brethren wouldn't know they were even there to many, many years later. It's when it really got ugly as far as a lot of folks departing from the truth. But people have long asked before then, uh, why do you people in the Church of Christ, when you assemble for worship and you sing, why don't you have mechanical instrumental music in the worship? Well, it comes from what the Bible teaches. It has nothing to do with our likes or dislikes. It's not a matter of just tradition. The word tradition, strictly speaking, is just handing down something that your forefathers and others have done. And that can be the truth or it can be error. It's a matter of saying, what pleases the Lord? And some people just simply will take a view as it doesn't make any difference anyway. Why be that picky? Well, when I'm taught, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, Colossians 3.17, that makes me ask, is my thinking under the authority of Christ? Is my speaking under the authority of Christ? Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Well, how do I do that if I don't know what the oracles of God are? I'm expected to be able to give a thus saith the Lord for what I believe in practice. Because I walk by faith and not by sight, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, 2 Corinthians 5.7 Romans 10, 17. So if I just say, well, I believe it's all right. Okay, where's the Bible that tells you to believe that? Well, if I don't know how it does it or I can't find it, then that's just simply your opinion. And opinions won't judge us on the day of judgment. Jesus said his word would, John 12, verse 48. Thus, I must be cautious. I must be careful. God expects you to be very careful in studying his word. 
And the Bible is full of material, and both Old and New Testament says, be careful, and here's what happened when you're not. Even when we sing with the children about building the house upon the sand and upon the rock, that's saying to them, learn to be careful what you believe, why you believe it, where you got your beliefs, why you do what you do in the name of Christ. Is it really in the name of Christ? That is by his authority. So I want today to deal with that particular point. Now, first of all, there are various types of worship recorded in the scriptures. When you study the New Testament on this given subject or any, you should try to look up all it has to say. If you say that takes too much time, then you're saying it, hell's going to be my home because that's what's going to happen. God doesn't just nonchalantly throw out things. We ought to be more careful about studying the Bible than anything else on this earth. Because I don't have to be what I ought to be as an individual or as a man or as a husband or a father or a neighbor. You know, the Lord addressed every one of those just how I should be. But where did he address those? In the Bible. I read in Matthew 15, 8 through 9 of a vain worship. Vain meaning empty or worthless. I would say a great example of that is what I've said for a number of times here lately is Cain. Cain, in the patriarchal age, worshipped God. Nobody could say he didn't. But it was wrong. And Hebrews 11, 4 says, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. How did he do it? It says, by faith. But faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Thus they received instruction in that long ago age of how God wanted to be worshipped. Cain kept the commandments, or rather Abel did, Cain did not. But he took the time to worship, built an altar, and offered stuff that he'd raised, but it was not what God said. Right there in the very beginning of the Bible it says, be careful what you do. So vain worship is one kind of worship, and it's condemned. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. When Paul stood on Mars Hill to preach the gospel to a bunch of idolaters and philosophers of his day, in Acts 17, verses 22 and 23, he talked about ignorant worship, uninformed worship, not the proper knowledge worship. And he says, I'm going to teach you the right way of worship. But we see there's two kinds of worship, vain worship and ignorant worship. Neither one is acceptable to God. And I need to start asking the question, do I engage in vain worship? Is my worship ignorant worship? But as he wrote to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, writing to the church in Colossae, he talked about will worship. Something was entering in on those folks at that time. And that will, W-I-L-L, will worship was wrong so here are three kinds of worship listed in the bible to teach me what is wrong now am i interested in being instructed by the new testament when i stand before the lord in judgment will i be aware of vain worship ignorant worship and will worship and know they were all wrong well now's the time to determine that because that's what time's all about is get ready to meet your maker when it comes down to John 4, 23 through 24, and the Lord's dealing with the woman of Samaria, he spoke of true worship. True worship. And the last one being the only one acceptable to God. God seeketh such to worship him. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's what true worship is. To worship in spirit is the proper disposition of mind. It's coming from the heart. And it's guided by the truth of God's will. Revelation. It is more than just worshiping with the right attitude in the right way. For such was true with regards to Old Testament worship. It means that it is a spiritual worship which is in harmony with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's closer to the very nature of God. Last week we mentioned that our duty on this earth in becoming a Christian is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to be like Christ. Many of our songs, if you'll pay attention to them, are 
praising God and asking Him, even in prayer, set the music to be like Him. Have you ever heard the song, Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer? What are you saying when you say that? Are you singing a lie? Or do you really mean, Oh, to be like Him, blessed Redeemer? This is my constant longing and prayer. How do you do that if you don't know what His will for your life is? If you don't have the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ only in the Word of Christ. So God is spirit. I'm learning by living the Christian life how to live on the spiritual level. Not on the level of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, or the fleshly level. I'm learning not to be that interested in the affairs of this present world. They're passing away. Well, I have to live here. God made me in a fleshly body that has fleshly needs. But he also gave me the book divine so that I will not get bogged down in those things. And they will not be the most important thing to my life. So we're trying to fit ourselves for the true tabernacle, which is in a glorified, resurrected body in the presence of God himself. And we strive daily to bring every thought into subjection to Christ, to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And the worship that we're engaged in today in this assembly of worship is designed to put our minds where they ought to be, to help us in being like God. While you had make some people today they're so secular and materialistic laugh at you if you said they would say what are you doing with your life I'm trying to be like God they'd probably want to put you in a, some sort of institution but that's exactly what we're doing is being Christians which means of Christ we want to be like God that'd be a wonderful thing if more people thought that way and realized the only way to be like him is to know his word to walk according to his truth now, if you contrast the Old Testament worship with the New Testament worship, you will contrast a, a system that's rooted more in the flesh and their shadows of the more actual thing that is revealed only in the New Testament. And you see that in the, in the study of the book of Hebrews. Very plain in there that the law was to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24, and it had its place. It did what it was designed to do, but it never was meant to be permanent. There is no higher spiritual plane on which one may live than to live as the New Testament teaches us to live. And that pertains to our worship also. So when we come down to this study, we want to consider music. The kind of music whereby God wants to be worshipped by the Lord's church. It's not a matter of what you like or I like. It's a matter of what God likes. Now, how do you figure out what God likes about what you're thinking right now? What your purposes and plans are right now? What you're doing with your life today and if tomorrow should come, what are you going to be doing with it then? Well, then it has to do when we have assembled for the very purpose of worship that we need to know something about what we're doing. And we see that the true worship is to worship God, worship God in spirit and in truth, and we spend a little time talking about what that is. We're talking about true spiritual music, unlike that found in the Old Testament. I don't believe, notice I say believe, faith comes from the Word of God, so I've got Scripture to back it up. I don't believe anybody knowing the Bible could say that the Old Testament worship is more spiritual than New Testament worship. As I say, the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament, James 125, the book that will judge us all on the last day, that great day of judgment, is designed to lift us up and allow a person, according to several abilities, to walk as spiritually as possible that he can be, walking in the footsteps of Jesus, being like God. That means we have to understand not only the disposition of mind that we're to have in trying to be like God and worshiping Him, but offering unto Him the spiritual worship that He wants. Have you ever noticed little children will sometimes run up to their mother or daddy and they'd say, see what I made, daddy? That was just like what you did yesterday. Why is that in us and why can't that teach us a lesson as children of God when it comes to the Father in heaven? Why don't we want to do that way? Why don't we want to approach him with that in mind, especially in this area? So we're interested in the music that is to be used 
by Christians as they've assembled for the given purposes we have today to worship God. That's just one act of worship. There are other acts. We're not talking about those. But they're all to be in spirit and in truth and authorized by the will of heaven. Let's look at the music that is true worship. You know, words do have meanings. They always have. Try to talk to somebody and tell them what you have in mind, not use words. Some way, as rudimentary as it can be, even if it's some rough sign language, <clears throat> still communicating. Even if it's a nod of the head, you're still communicating. No, yes. That's pretty well universal. Not only, let me emphasize that. And study it all you want and study it you should. The only music commanded, authorized in the New Testament is vocal. It's not just any kind of vocal. But it, every scripture in the New Testament that pertains to worshiping God in music specifies a kind of music. It specifies singing. Now let's look at some scriptures. If you look at what's revealed in Matthew 26, 30 and Mark 14, 26, you'll see that uh, Jesus and his disciples went out and it says before they went out of that room, they sung a hymn. Mark that down. You'll notice when Paul and Silas had preached the gospel and got themselves in prison for preaching the gospel because they loved the souls of men, they were fast in the Stocks of the inner prison having been beaten at about midnight, Acts 16, 25, the prisoners heard them and they were singing hymns. Now let's notice this, and I will not try to read all of these. It would take that much more time. We're looking at every scripture in the New Testament speaking of music whereby God is worshipped. In Romans 15, 9, it talks about singing to your name. In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, I will sing with the Spirit and with the understanding also. In Ephesians 5, verse 19, which we'll look at that a little more later, he speaks of singing and making melody in your heart. Colossians 3, 16, singing with grace, favor in your hearts to the Lord. In Hebrews 2, and verse 12, he talks about singing praise to God. In James 5 and verse 13, the fellow that's happy and rejoicing, let him sing psalms. If you're going to understand people, you know there's a difference in specific and generic authorization. We understand it in every way about us. I was studying with a man many, many years ago who was trying to say mechanical instrument of music and worship of God is all right. And I was trying to emphasize to him, he was a much older man, than I was older than I am now, and I was probably in my 20s. I was in his home, and I was trying to emphasize to him the difference in that which is specific and that which is general or generic. And I asked him if he would hand me a book. I happened to see it on a shelf right beside him. I remember the name of it, or did then, or saw the name of it. I don't remember it now. And I asked him for that particular book. And he reached up and got it. It kind of looked peculiar at me, but I was used to that. And he gave me that. I said, why didn't you give me that ashtray sitting right there? Well, he really looked funny at me then. He said, you said you wanted and I, whatever the name of that book. I said, yes, by those words, I specified exactly what I wanted, and you understood them, and you didn't give me the ashtray because you knew the difference. Now, why can't we let God have that much sense? I'm being facetious, but he speaks to us on, on our own level of understanding. Sometimes we see in doctors, you know, the doctor says in surgery, scalpel, please. I guess they say please. They may not. They just say scalpel. Well, he doesn't expect you to stick it in his hand. He doesn't expect you to give him a pair of forceps because words have meanings and he specified what he wanted and in specifying that, he didn't specify anything else. Why must we need to get on that level when we're in our everyday dealings? If somebody says, pass the salt, 
and you give him a glass of water. What sense is that? Or he gives you sugar. Which one? What, what, what makes sense about that? God spoke where we could understand him. Then where's the problem? Doesn't suit us. That's exactly where the problem is. We don't think it's necessary. We think that's being too picky. But yet we like to be picky. Go to a restaurant, order something. And they bring you right the opposite of what it's specified in the menu that they have and they're offering it to you to buy. People have big fits over that. <laughs> but when it comes to going to heaven and worshiping God and using this world to get ready, no big deal. Evidently Cain thought that. I don't want to be in his shoes or sandals or if he had on any. The, new, the music in the New Testament emphasized the spiritual. I said we'd come back to Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to yourselves. That's what we do in the assembly when we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Speaking to yourselves, and he specifies the kind of music. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He tells you the kind of music when he says singing. And he tells you where the melody is to be made, making melody in your heart. And all of it's directed to God because it's in the worship of God. And by the way, the Greek word that's translated worship in most cases is proskuneo, which means to engage in an act of obeisance, literally to kiss the hand forward or to prostrate oneself before one of higher authority. That's the idea. We're humbling ourselves before God we're showing our devotion to him. Making melody in Ephesians 5 and verse 19 translates the Greek word solantes. And it is true in earlier Greek before the first century in the development of that language, which is a living language then, even as English is a living language now, that at one time it had reference to plucking the hair or plucking the strings as of a stringed instrument. That's exactly correct. But that was not the case when it came down to the Holy Spirit guiding Paul to use solantes that they rendered in the translators making melody. Because it tells you where that melody is made. It tells you what strings are plucked making melody in your heart. The heart strings are plucked. So it's to be done in the heart, not an outward thing. If I were to say up here today, I baptize. And I go into a study of the word baptizo and it says to bury. All right. I bury. I immerse. Does that tell you the whole story? What or who's being immersed? Well, when you look at Salantes, it talks about the plucking of strings. But that's not all of the word of God in this. What strings are plucked? And he tells you. The strings of the heart. Singing and making melody in your heart directed to the Lord. Now that means that this is by spiritual as it can get. It means it comes from the depths of your spirit. It's not outward. It's not mechanical. It's not physical. But it's spiritual. Now since the music is to be offered to the Lord, then that means we have a disposition of heart, an attitude, a mindset that regards Him as holy. And we're very concerned about offering only what he specified. We have an Old Testament example of that. To where they didn't offer what was specified. Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, offered what the Bible calls strange fire. Strange to the teaching of the authority or what was authorized in the law of Moses. Now, that was written before time for your learning and my learning. What do you learn from that? You do only what's authorized. 
even when it comes to the fire that God wanted them to use, it was to come from a certain place. Well, somebody says, I don't see anything wrong with that. No big deal to me. Fire's fire. One will burn just as much as the other. But God has specified in his word that fire. And when they offered fire strange to the authority of God, he made it very clear how he thought about it. And they died before the Lord. If you look at Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19, they're, they're parallel passages written by the Holy Spirit through the same apostle to two different churches. We see then that it's all in your heart. You know, that's not unlike any of the other acts of worship or anything else we do throughout the week. For we're to yield our bodies living sacrifices to God throughout the week. Thus in our worship, when we pray, it's coming from the heart as the Word of God directs us and teaches us to pray to God. When we give of our means, we have to reflect upon what we have and as we have prospered and we plan on that so that when we contribute on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, that's spiritual. As we've been prospered, without grudging, cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. Same thing's true of our prayer. It all is set on the highest form we can get to in the flesh to be spiritual and not let the flesh and its desires run our affairs. You look at every human church, it's there because people like the way that's done. It suits them. It's not a matter of suiting God. It's not a matter of being very careful in your study of the Bible, of learning how to handle a right or right and divide the word of truth, to ascertain only what the Lord's authorized us to do. What if God had taken that view of the forgiveness of our sins? Why would Jesus have ever left heaven and put himself through all of that? Old Testament music was all on a more fleshly level, as was all of that time period. It was never meant to be on the level of the teaching of the New Testament. It was designed as a system of shadows and types to bring them to Christ. But when you look at the teaching of God on anything in the New Testament, especially music whereby God is worshipped, the whole congregation assembles and all engage in speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in their heart to the Lord. The same thing's true as we observe the Lord's Supper. We're mindful of what the bread means and what the fruit of the vine. We're even taught by Christ to thank Him for this bread which represents Christ's body. It seems to me it's very difficult to get some members to ever learn to say thank you. They pray about everything under the sun about the body of Christ. For some reason they can't get out of their gizzard to say we thank you for this bread which represents the body offered on cross for our sin. I don't know why we can't follow a simple thing like that. Of course we can really get after the denominations for not doing it but it seems like we have about the biggest problem or big a problem as they do. So there's no official choirs and all that kind of thing, although there was in Judaism. If you read through the book of Psalms, you see these little words, Selah, and things like that. That was a thought to be by the scholars where they would pause there and they would pray some sort of uh, mechanical instrument music or whatever. Notice the melody again, I emphasize, is made in the harp, not on a harp. Heart. And not on a harp. That's because we do what the Bible says. The whole emphasis is on the spiritual, not on the material. So the spiritual emphasis is what the New Testament emphasizes. Everybody's singing. The emphasis is not so much on the sound, but that we are making true melody and our hearts and our minds are directing all that to the Lord as we teach one another by those words. But I will tell you this. Just like you go to classes to learn how to preach and to prepare a sermon outline and to deliver it, or you study more about hermeneutics and learn how to write the divide of the principles of Bible interpretation, then when it comes to offering the best praise you can offer to God in singing, then if you will sing and learn how to sing to the best of your ability, you're always going to be better. 
Now, I admit, and you know it too, that you hear some people sing, and it sounds like the cats all went fighting and garbage can outdoor. But when that person is doing the best they can do according to the word of the living God to worship him in spirit and in truth, as we've studied that, that suits God. But all of us can get, get, can get better at anything God enjoins upon us to do to be faithful to him, and that includes every act of worship. Lest people think that we're unusual in this view, and I don't think most denominational people even know this is in their history, I want to notice some references of, on music from some people who are not members of the Church of Christ in times past concerning music in the New Testament church. I'll just simply call this the voice of history, some voices of history. Paul Henry Lang in his music in Western Civilization, pages 53 and 54 says, and I'm quoting, all our sources deal amply with vocal music of the church, but they do not mention any of other manifestations of musical art. Then he said the development of Western music was decisively influenced by the exclusion of musical instruments from the early Christian church, unquote. And then coming to another man, uh, his work was Music, History, and Ideas, page 34, Hugo Lectertritt. He says only singing, however, and no playing of instruments was permitted in the early Christian church. Emil Nauman the History of uh, Music, Volume 1, page 177. There can be no doubt that originally the music of the divine service was everywhere entirely of a vocal nature. Then in going to Dr. Frederick Lewis Ritter in his work, History of Music from the Christian Era to the Present Time, page 28, he has this to say. We have no real knowledge of the exact character of the music which formed a part of the religious devotion of the Christian congregations. It was, however, purely vocal. Going to Lyman Coleman, who was of the, Pres of the Presbyterians, and his work, The Apostolic and Primitive Church, pages 368 to 369, both the Jews in their temple service and the Greeks in their idol worship, were accustomed to sing with the accompaniment of instrumental music. The converts to Christianity, accordingly, must have been familiar with, that mode, with this mode of singing. And he goes ahead to say, but it is generally admitted that the primitive Christians employed no instrumental music in their worship. It may seem odd that music was entirely vocal in the church of the first century at the time of the writing of the New Testament and for many years thereafter. And I say it may seem odd because it's obvious from history that there was much instrumental music in certain places as Jews and Gentiles we just noticed. But not when you recall that the worship in the New Testament was to be spiritual in emphasis and we've already studied that, now do you believe it? There is more on this We'll call it the voice of various religious sources. First of all, Roman Catholic from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Quote, the first Christians were too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments for or to use them to accompany the human voice. From the Greek Orthodox, the execution a Byzantine church music by instruments or even the accompaniment of sacred chanting by instruments was ruled out by the Eastern Fathers as being incompatible with the pure, solemn, spiritual character of the religion of Christ. That's from Constantine Kavarnos, Byzantine sacred music. From John Calvin, of course he was behind the establishment of the Presbyterian Church, in his commentary on the book of Romans, volume 1, page 539, here's what he said. <clears throat> Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God will be no more suitable than the burning of incense, 
the lighting of, up of lamps, the restoration of the other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things, from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostle is far more pleasing to him. John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist Church, had this to say, I have no objection to instruments of, mu of music in our chapels, provided they're neither heard nor seen. Then further from the Methodist, Adam Clark, commentator, old commentator, music as a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music. Here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. The Lutheran Church, this is coming from McClintock in Strong's Encyclopedia, which came out somewhere along about the middle of the 19th century. I have, a, I have it. Anyway, Martin Luther called the organ an ensign of Baal. From the Baptist, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great 19th century preachers who has excellent lessons. He preached in London for years. He said, I would as soon attempt to pray to God with machinery as to sing to him with machinery. Now, why did these men object so strongly to mechanical instrument of music in the worship of the church? Well, really, if you listen to what they said, you know. They're saying that the New Testament system is on a spiritual plane of which the Old Testament is not. It was bringing over Jewish worship. And we need to understand that while we don't need to know all of this, if we know our Bible, that's why I started where I did. That the only kind of music you can find that God wants whereby he is worship is singing. So we don't want to do anything that waters down the Bible, that changes it, that emphasizes what God doesn't want to emphasize, to go back to a system of shadows and types when we have the real thing in the will of Christ and the words of the New Testament. Now, we'll go a little longer than I usually do, but finally I want us to consider justification or attempts, I guess I should say, more accurately, uh, justification offered for the use of mechanical instruments of music. And one of them is, as I started out a while ago, well, it's always been a tradition in our church. Well, anytime I start hearing somebody say that, you know they're not thinking about what does the Lord want? And the only way I can find out is to go to the Bible. And whatever he says, I'll do. The attitude should be, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command that I will obey. But it's not. Let's go to your church, I'll go to mine, we'll all get to heaven together, which you can't find a thing in the world the New Testament teaches such a thing. Same thing's true of worship. Must be authorized by the Lord. So, I would say further on this, <clears throat> we've learned already that history reveals the use, the non-use of such things in the churches. And a lot of people that were members of churches a few hundred years ago that presently and how for a good while used mechanical instrument music was opposed to it. If you go to the big cathedrals in Europe that were erected, say, a thousand years ago, and this is very interesting to note, you'll see huge pipe organs. But if you'll look at them, if you'll study the history of that big cathedral, you'll see in the original building of that, there wasn't any place built architecturally for that organ. They had to take up space later on when mechanical instrumental music became acceptable and build a place for it. And thus the word a cappella, singing is in the chapel. It meant singing as was commonly done without any mechanical instrumental music. Somebody else says, I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't know how to discuss with people. I don't see anything wrong with it. A blind person, blind since birth, can't see the sun. And if you ask them, do you see the sun? If he's totally blind, no. Well, I guess it's not there. Well, when it comes to anything that God teaches, there's somebody that says, well, I just don't see anything wrong with it. But that's your problem. Not the teaching of the Bible. Remember the ignorant worship? Paul says, I'm here to straighten you out on that in Acts 17. 
Simply because you're not aware, thus you don't see anything wrong with it, doesn't mean it's not there. We ought to believe what Paul wrote to Timothy, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. And then there are those that just say, I like it in my worship to God. Where do we learn that what you like is what, how God's going to judge us? Colossians 2, 20 through 23, refutes will worship. We've already dealt with that. The Bible deals with it. Just because you will it to be so and it suits you and you like it doesn't mean God accepts it. Remember Cain? Remember Nadab and Abihu? So we're not interested in offering what you like. Imagine if every one of us in here was sitting there. When you come together, everybody does what you, you just do what you please and what feels good to you. Well, that's the denominationalism. And you know, somebody in those churches says, we will do this. Even if it's a full-scale orchestra, that thing plays at one point and it quits at another point. So everybody has some time of starting and stopping. Even if it's wrong, they do it. Then, of course, people say, well, they got be people in the Old Testament. They used it. Well, do you offer animal sacrifices? Or are you just going to pick out of the Old Testament what suits that you like today? If you're going to choose the body of law that is the Old Testament, then look at all the things you've got to do to be sure that you abide by that consistently. And yet I learned from Hebrews 9 and verse 10 that all those things that was enjoined upon the Jews was imposed upon them until the time of reformation. Well, that time's come, and God expects his people to worship differently, or else you wouldn't have Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman, John 4, verses 23 through 24. Because he made it clear right now, while the law is binding, we're right as Jews to worship down here in the temple. He even told her, you don't know what you worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But you said the time's coming when you won't worship here or in Jerusalem. Because he said, God seeketh such to worship him. What, were the, what was the such? Those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's what the New Testament does under the authority of Christ. It teaches us how to worship on the highest spiritual level and how to live day by day on the highest spiritual level. The fact that God may have commanded it in the past doesn't mean that he approves it now. Well, can't we see that in the law of Moses and in some Jews who became Christians saying, well, these Gentiles can be saved by obeying the gospel, but they've got to be circumcised to keep the law too. Well, that got them in big trouble. Paul contended with them. He said, that's not right. Just read Acts 15. Read Galatians. And you'll see you can't reach back over in the Old Testament pick and choose what you want. Also consider Moses, a great man. The Bible says he's the meekest man on earth. And you'll find as he dealt over 40 years with the murmuring and cantankerous rebellious children of Israel that God first told him when they needed water to strike a rock, Exodus 17, 5 through 6. That's what God told him. Specify, you, Moses, strike that rock and you'll get the water you need. Well, he was so angry and frustrated at them later on, God told him to speak to a rock, Numbers 27 through 8, but he was so frustrated and angry, he struck the rock, and thus he broke God's law. He sinned, and Numbers 29 through 12 tells us God punished him with that sin by not allowing him to enter the land of Canaan. God means what he says, that's what he means, and it's in his word. What was his sin? He did not treat God holy by doing only what God had commanded at that present time. Do we think we're any different? God may have authorized, he could have, say one way or the other, I won't even get into that. Mechanical instrument for music, the worship of the Jews. So what? <laughs> he authorized all sorts of things. A Levitical priesthood, how they were to dress, all these sacrifices and so forth. But that's not so in the New Testament. When it comes to worship of God in music, vocal, music, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is exactly what he authorized. Why try to gainsay him? Why just do something because, well, that's what I've always done, and I know he'll accept it because I was sincere in doing it. 
The melody is made in the human heart, and I don't mean the blood pump, I mean the inward man, not on mechanical instruments of music. Well, as we close the lesson, I hope you see we've had a little study on the importance, not only of the kind of music God wants to be worshipped with, but on the authority of the New Testament. Also, to realize that that New Testament, when we will abide by it and do only what's authorized, sets us on a plane that's the highest spiritual plane you can live on in this world. That people, our day and time, are not careful and cautious when they're studying the Bible. It's just a lick and a promise. They don't pay much attention to it. That's the way we live today. Just sort of thumb your nose at God and... He loves you so much anyway, he wouldn't dare let you go to heaven after all his son died for Jim or the other to go to hell. He'll always issue a place, have a place for you in heaven. Can't we see from the scriptures and the plainness of them and the just <clears throat> bluntness of them sometimes what God wants? So the problems where it's always been with mankind. We have our mindset, we're going to do it our way. But remember, the way to hell is broad and wide, and many there be that go in there at. We must be resolved in our heart to obey the truth at all costs, even when it comes, especially as it comes to worshiping God and in every act of worship. If you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come to him on his terms while we stand and while we sing.